Washington Post reporter Craig Whitlock begins Chapter 15 in his new book, The Afghanistan Papers, this way. Quote, Hamid Karzai's fraudulent re-election worsened a deluge of corruption that engulfed Afghanistan in 2009 and 2010. Dark money cascaded over the country. Money launderers lugged suitcases loaded with a million dollars or more on flights leaving Kabul so crooked businessmen and politicians could stash their ill-gotten fortunes offshore, unquote. We asked Mr. Whitlock to expand on this and other stories from his book, The Afghanistan Papers. Craig Whitlock, when you go back to the beginning of this process of finding the Afghanistan papers and then publish them in the Washington Post in 2019, and now your book, The Afghanistan Papers, what were you thinking at the moment? And I know that Michael Flynn triggered it, but what were the circumstances and what year was it? Sure. So it was five years ago in the summer of 2016. It's hard to believe it, it's taken this long, but at the time, it really just started as, as a reporter uh, chasing a tip. I had heard from a source that uh, this federal agency called the Special Inspector General for Afghanistan had conducted an interview with uh, General Michael Flynn, who at the time was becoming well known for his endorsement of, of Donald Trump in the presidential election. Uh, he was getting a lot of n- notoriety for standing up at the Republican National Convention and leading chants of lock her up about Hillary Clinton. Uh, so he was becoming a known figure in the political world. But in the military, which I covered for several years, Flynn was actually pretty highly regarded from his time in military intelligence and had overseen intelligence operations in Afghanistan for a number of years. So when I heard he had given this interview, an unclassified one that hadn't been made public, I I really wanted to know what Flynn had said. So I put in a simple public records request for the transcript of the interview and thought I would get it in a few days. Uh, Long story short, uh, the inspector general uh, sat on it, denied it, and the Washington Post had to go to court twice, uh, suing the inspector general under the Freedom of Information Act to obtain Flynn's interview, but also hundreds of other interviews like it with people who were played key roles in the war and were frankly confessing all the things that went wrong. Can you give us some idea of how many people have been involved at the Washington Post to get to that December uh, 2019 article and then through your book? So scores of people. I mean, this is a real newsroom wide effort. I was the reporter and I wrote it, but Uh, The number of editors, page designers, database managers, producers, photographers, graphic artists. Uh, We we had a a working group of, you know, 10 to 15 people that met weekly for the better part of a year to produce the original series. You know, I was really, really fortunate that the Washington Post took on this project. And there was a decision made at the top under then editor Marty Barron and managing editor Cameron Barr that we were going to Uh, share all the documents we obtained in this reporting with the public, that we were going to post them all online and we were going to weave them into the story so people could see for themselves the things that uh, people said in these these transcripts and interviews. Um, So that took an enormous amount of time uh, and and resources. Uh, So I, I can't put a number on it, but, you know, certainly over 50 people were involved in the original series. And then you know, a smaller number of people in the book. But this is a Washington Post book uh, from start to finish and, and a reporting project. So it's something I, I'm very proud of, and I think the newsroom is too. So how about the legal aspect of this when you went to court? Who made that decision and who did it? And were you, did you go to the courtroom when they made the decision? So I recommended to my editors, it kind of went up through our chain of command. I said, I think, you know, there's something here. I I, I from what I understand, Flynn said some incendiary things in this interview, uh, but we're, we can't get our hands on it. You know, I've exhausted my FOIA appeals. What should we do? And fortunately, my editors, uh, David Fallis at the Post and Jeff Lean on the investigative desk, uh, recommended we consider a lawsuit. So this went up again through our editor, Marty Barron, our publisher, Fred Ryan, and our legal department. 
uh, headed by Jim McLaughlin, who oversaw this, and uh, they agreed that this is something that this really got to the heart of what we do at the Post, which is to hold the government accountable. And since it had to do with the war and what people in government were saying about mistakes made during the war, that this is something the public not just had a right to know, but uh, you know deserved to know, and it was important. So the Post hired uh, some outside lawyers. Uh, and they did a great job at going to court. I myself didn't actually have to go to court. This was all done through briefings. But eventually, over time, we compelled the inspector general to release these documents in batches. But it took three years. What court was it in? And do you remember who the judge was that decided I think, two cases, two separate cases? That's right. So it was in U.S. federal court, district court in Washington. The judge is Amy Berman Jackson. And so there's some interesting backstory to this. Part of the reason it took a while is she was the judge in the Roger Stone case, you know, one of Donald Trump's political allies who had been uh, indicted uh, for some of the dirty tricks he had been playing on behalf of Trump. And Berman Jackson was sort of consumed with that case. And I think that was one reason our case took a while to resolve. But our lawyers uh, that the Post uh, retained from Ballard Spar, which is a well-known uh, First Amendment firm. Uh, you know, they did a great job at persisting with this. And it, like I said, it took took a number of years, but we gradually, you know, we had to file a lot of legal briefs arguing our position. And, uh, you know, the judge was favorable on most of it. And the inspector general finally uh, gave in a bit, although ironically, we're still fighting in court. This This lawsuit, there are two of them, as you pointed out. The first one was to get the Flynn documents. The second one was to get the rest. And that second lawsuit is still pending in court before Judge Jackson because we think there are more documents and more material out there that the public uh, should be allowed to see. Is there any possibility that John, I mean, we've had John Sopko on uh, the cigar uh, on the network several times. And he actually even teared up in an interview that I did with him a number of years ago because of what he saw in Afghanistan. Is there any chance that he said to somebody, go ahead and sue me. That's the only way I can get these interviews out. Well, that's a good question. And this is something I've sort of struggled to resolve in my head with, with John Sopko because you know, he had a reputation as a very aggressive inspector general who knew that there were enormous problems uh, with the way the United States was carrying out military operations and and spending on trying to build up the Afghan government over the years. Sopko gave a lot of interviews. He still does. And so on one hand, he feels it's important to hold government institutions to account. And yet here he is sitting on this this treasure trove of documents where people were admitting in the most frank terms that the war had been a failure. And I, I still can't quite understand why he was so reluctant to release them. I personally uh, beseeched him to release these and made my case in person on the phone and in court. And, I, you know, the, the only explanation I can come up with is his his uh, response was that if they release these documents and people would no longer be willing to speak to the inspector general to share information. Uh, the post position on this was, uh, first of all, it's not Sopko's up to his discretion. The law is clear. These were unclassified interviews. Uh, there is no reason to withhold them. They were paid for with public funds. The public deserves to know if people in charge of the war were admitting all these mistakes. Uh, that you know, it was it was you know how how can you argue against that? And I think Sopko was just more worried about uh, harming his bureaucratic privileges. That this might make his job harder in the future. But our argument was. You know that doesn't matter. That pales in in comparison to the public's right to know and and the necessity of informing the public about these documents. After all of your success, both in the newspaper and your book, John Sopko's outfit published in August uh, twenty years of lessons learned in Afghanistan, and I want to read to you what he said or the editor said in this in that publication which is available to the public and just get your reaction to it he said due in part to the politically sensitive nature of reconstruction efforts a majority of interviewees that informed or were quoted in this report wish to remain anonymous for those still working in government confidentiality was particularly important 
Therefore, to preserve anonymity, our interviews often cite, quote, a senior U.S. official, unquote, a U.S. AID official or a former NSC official. They're still holding to the fact that these people aren't going to be quoted in their publication, but you have to go to the Post. What's your reaction when you hear that? Well, it's infuriating, frankly. He's so worried about protecting the confidentiality of people who admitted these fundamental failures in the longest conflict in American history, right? 20 years, uh, 2,400 U.S. troops lost their lives. The U.S. government spent $2 trillion. Uh, more than 100,000 Afghans were killed. And, they're, you know, it's important to have accountability. So if you have people in the U.S. government who were admitting uh, that they didn't know what they were doing in Afghanistan, and that's a quote from a number of people in those interviews, or that uh, this was an unwinnable war, or that they didn't have a military strategy. You know, on what basis are those essentially confessions being withheld from the public just to protect someone's reputation or to hope that they'll speak to the inspector general again? I can see that SOPCO and the inspector general uh, maybe th- they made these interviews and told people, well, talk freely and we'll keep your name out of it. But the fact of the matter is, under the law, under the Freedom of Information Act, this is public information. The public has a right to see it. And I just, you know, I- I'm baffled that they're still holding to this position that this information should be withheld. You know, the irony is in this report they just published, they did quote a number of officials on the record who had given interviews for their project. These are interviews that were conducted uh, several years ago, in 2015 and 2016. The Post had already obtained those interviews under our lawsuits and had published them. And frankly, the Inspector General just sat on them for more years for no reason. And only now are they starting to release some of those names and that information. And I I just find that unconscionable. We asked John Sabko to talk to us about all this, and he, for the time being, said he's not taking uh, any requests uh, for interviews. I know he had some in August, but and 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 we may or may not get him in the future. Um, Let me ask you about yourself. Where are you from originally? So I was born in upstate New York. I grew up in Pennsylvania, a little town called Kennett Square, known as the mushroom capital of the world. It's about halfway between Philadelphia and Lancaster. Uh, I went to college in North Carolina and immediately went into newspapers and have been doing that ever since. What college? I went to Duke in Durham, and I was the editor of the school paper, which is how I got my start in journalism. How long have you been at the Post? I've been at the Post uh, 23 years, since 1998. By the way, in our 20. 20 interview with you on the Washington Journal, you said that you were going to write a book about Fat Leonard. I know that's on a whole different subject. And are you still going to write a book? And what's the status of Fat Leonard and the San Diego trials? Yeah, so Fat Leonard, uh, just for a little background, is the name of a defense contractor from Malaysia who had supplied uh, the U.S. Navy ships and submarines throughout Asia with, with water, fuel, uh, food, any equipment they needed, any time they pull into port into Asia. And uh, this turned into an enormous corruption racket where he defrauded the U.S. government of tens of millions of dollars. But he also uh, bribed dozens and dozens of U.S. Navy officers with prostitutes, uh, extraordinarily fancy meals, uh, cash payments, you name it. So it, it really is it's the worst corruption scandal in U.S. military history. And I covered it intensely for the Post, but I am writing a book about it, and that'll be coming out hopefully uh, next year. So the Afghanistan papers kind of happened in the middle of my Fat Leonard reporting, so I had to put it aside a little bit. But that's that's a really sordid and fascinating tale that I can't wait to tell in full because it's it's even worse and more shocking than than people knew from some of the news coverage. Former admirals have gone to prison and a lot of other people. I think there was just a case on a warrant officer. But but what what's behind all this and why is it taking so long for it to get through the courts, get through the Navy? Uh, what's the story there for? And I won't I won't go on much with this because I'll wait for your book. But I wanted to get an update. No, it's it's a good question, and you know it, it turns out even though the Navy has admitted this, it's, I found out through reporting that 
you know, more than a thousand people were investigating this case, people who had served in the Navy or served as civilians uh, who had contact with, with Fat Leonard over two decades. So it's this enormous case, and it has taken the federal government, the Justice Department, and NCIS, the Naval Criminal Investigative Service, it took them years to get their arms around it, in part because Leonard had penetrated federal law enforcement. Some of his the people he bribed served as case agents. And so this made it very difficult for the government to to prosecute him, to, to you know, to find enough evidence to, to arrest him. And then the amount of material they accumulated in terms of Leonard's emails and photographs of him and Navy officers with prostitutes. I mean, it's just this unbelievable storehouse of information. And it has moved very, very slowly in the courts. I don't have a good explanation for that. Uh, More than two dozen Navy officers have already uh, pleaded guilty, but there's one last trial with seven defendants remaining that uh, is supposed to go to trial now in February of next year. But that's taken uh, five years from the time they were indicted, and it's just moved at a glacial pace through the courts. Back to your book. Uh, how corrupt was Hamid Karzai, who is still in Afghanistan, and Afras Ghani and some of the rest of the leaders over the years? Well, this is something you see in the interviews for the Afghanistan papers. It's sort of fascinating to see the, the transformation of Karzai in American eyes, that during the Bush administration, he was seen as this great democratic hope in Afghanistan, uh, he was somebody who was allied very, very closely with the Bush administration. He had weekly teleconferences with President Bush for a while, and he depended heavily on the Americans to help them create a new government. Uh, and he was elected in what appeared to be free and fair elections in 2004. And this was something that was uh, hailed by the United States and other countries. But over time, uh, the Americans began to have their doubts about Karzai and and thought he had allowed a lot of people in his government to become corrupt. You know, there's a lot of debate of whether Karzai himself was taking money, although, you know, the CIA, it turned out, was delivering bags of cash to his office that he could dispense his political favors. But one of the problems was that Karzai's half-brother, a guy named Ahmed Wali Karzai, uh, was corrupt, and he was taking a lot of money from defense contracts and other payments as the sort of political boss of Kandahar. Uh, And in some documents I obtained for the book, uh, there's a sort of fraught moment where the U.S. Ambassador Ronald Newman, uh, back around 2006, 2007, confronted Karzai and said, you have to take action against these corrupt officials in your government, including your brother, who was essentially the governor of Kandahar. And Karzai looked at the ambassador and said, you've got to be nuts. You want me to go after my brother? Well, do you have any evidence that he's corrupt or that, you know, the Americans were sort of alluding that he was involved in the narcotics trade? And the Americans said, well, we don't have hard evidence. And they sort of backtracked. And then Karzai got really angry and said, look, if, if he's got money, it's because you Americans are giving it to him. Right. And and of course, he was right that this this led to a broader issue in the war, that corruption was a huge problem in the Afghan government. It only got worse over the years. But the reason for it was because the United States was spending so much money in Afghanistan on defense contracts, humanitarian aid, trying to rebuild the country. It was more money than Afghanistan could possibly absorb. So uh, not surprisingly, a lot of it ended up in people's pockets. So, yes, corruption was a huge problem in Afghanistan up until the end uh, of our troops being there. But, you know, the United States is largely to, to blame for it. Is there any evidence that anybody in Washington, D.C. cares about this expenditure of money, both in Iraq and in Afghanistan? Well, of course, I think people care, you know, no question. And you see this in time and time again in the interviews we obtained for, for the Afghanistan papers is people complaining about this, that they're being told to spend money on projects that didn't make any sense, that they were just spending it so quickly, particularly during the Obama administration, just to show that they could spend it. There was a rush to try and build up Afghanistan so we could pull out. Uh, And there were just complaint after complaint about it. But uh, in the end, this comes down to a policy decision from the top, particularly under President Obama, that they, you know, one way to win the war was with America's economic might. But again, it just backfired completely because 
uh, we, we did this willy-nilly without a whole lot of thought put into it as to whether it was doing any good. Quoting from uh, the Lessons Learned um, Cigar uh, government publication, they quote a USAID official, quote, The Hill has always uh, been asking, did you spend the money? I didn't hear many questions about what the effects were. Uh, anybody in Congress ever really pinned down during these 20 years how the money was being spent, stopped the flow of money, questioned it at all? And if they are, who are they? Can you name them? Well, you know, people in Congress, I mean, there were a number of hearings about this, and they were the ones who actually authorized the creation of the Office of the Inspector, in General, uh, the Inspector, Inspector General to investigate cases of fraud, waste, and abuse. And John Sopko, the Inspector General, has done that. He's publicized a number of cases, dozens of cases over the years, and reported this back to Congress. But in the end, Congress authorized all the money being spent there. You know, the power of the purse lies with our lawmakers, and they were the ones who authorized the spending levels. Uh, but in, in terms of did anybody care, I mean, there was one interview in particular in the Afghanistan papers with uh, a retired Army Lieutenant General, Doug Luth, who served as the, the war czar overseeing policy in the war in Afghanistan under both Bush and Obama. And he said, you know, this, this made no sense how much money we were spending so quickly. He said, you know, yes, we're a rich nation, and every once in a while we can, you know, break the bank to fix a problem if need be, but what were we thinking in Afghanistan? You know, this, this just didn't make any sense. So in retrospect, even the people working in the White House and other positions of power recognized that uh, this was insane, quite frankly, the way we were going about it. But, uh, you know, I think it just took on a life of its own, and Congress went along with what the executive branch was considering, particularly during the Obama administration. And, you know, it just it, once, once things get rolling in terms of spending in Washington, it's hard to slow it down. Actually, in the, uh, in the Cigar Report, it said they found that, quote, the incentive structure did not encourage U.S. officials to report on waste, fraud and abuse. So what's the point of what's the point of having a cigar if the structure just doesn't incentivize somebody to report on this? And here we found our find ourselves 20 years later, according to, uh, as, as you know, the Brown University Costs of War Project, eight trillion dollars spent on Iraq, Pakistan Syria and Afghanistan, and we didn't have the money in the first place. Well, this is Congress again. They're the ones who are supposed to provide oversight for this. They're the ones who are authorizing the spending. And again, that's the paradox that you know they have someone like the Inspector General reporting all these this fraud, waste, and abuse. But uh, you know, Congress would have hearings. They would accept the reports. They would say it's important to know about it. They would posture for the cameras sometimes and, and say this is terrible, these specific cases of, of corruption or, or fraud. But, you know, over 20 years, they didn't rein this in. They authorized the use of military force in Afghanistan, Iraq, and these other places. And, you know, Congress has been very reluctant, members from both parties, to hold the executive branch to account in this regard. Let me read from a Washington Post story, September the 4th, 2021 by Isaac Stanley Becker. Get your reaction. Last year, retired General Joseph Dunford Jr., who commanded American forces in Afghanistan in 2013 and 2014, joined the board of Lockheed Martin, the Pentagon's biggest defense contractor. Retired General John R. Allen, who preceded him in Afghanistan, is the president of the Brookings Institution, which has received as much as $1.5 million over the last three years from Northrop, Grum Northrop Grumman. Another defense giant, David H. Petraeus, who preceded Allen and later pleaded guilty to a misdemeanor charge for providing classified materials to a former mistress and biographer as a partner at KKR, a private equity firm and director of its global institute. And I'm sure you know that John Walters, who was involved in the drug uh, interdictions and all in the Bush administration, is now the CEO of the Hudson Institute. I can go on with these stories. How does this happen if everybody was so wrong and they're now given these expensive board seats for these uh, defense contractors? Well, that's a really good question, Brian. And, and Isaac did a great article on that in the Washington Post. I consulted with him a little bit, but his reporting was first rate. And this is exactly the question. 
how could these people in charge of a failing war, the longest war in American history, land on their feet financially and in the public eye? Uh, and I think it really gets to the question that there really hasn't been uh, any accountability for the people who oversaw our policy there and what we did in Afghanistan, uh, both from in terms of military strategy, but also in terms of the spending. There's just we kind of let things slide, and particularly for uh, senior commanders in uniform, uh, there's a tendency in America to kind of exalt them. We have a lot of respect for people in uniform, for people who devote their careers to protecting the country, but sometimes there's a reluctant to hold them accountable for when things go awry. And in this case, I think there's a lot of frustration, particularly among veterans who served in Afghanistan, who saw their, their friends or fellow soldiers or Marines die, or who they themselves uh, lost limbs or suffered enduring uh, wounds in Afghanistan in that war, to see these generals who ran the conflict, who were in charge, uh, frankly, become wealthy. I think there's a lot of veterans who aren't wealthy off this war who are having to bear these scars for the rest of their lives. They, they have a hard time accepting that. I looked up uh, the major corporations in defense contracting, Boeing, Raytheon, Lockheed Martin, General Dynamics, Northrop Grumman, uh, Huntington, Ingalls. All of them have somebody who served in a high position in the military uh, on their boards of directors. Uh, you know, for instance, John Richardson's on the Boeing board, along with Edmund Giambastiani, uh, former vice uh, chair of, of the Joint Chiefs. Richardson was the 31st chief of naval operations. And Stacey Harris was a former inspector general at U.S. Air Force. It seems like that no matter what your experience is, no matter whether you failed or not, that you can succeed in corporate America. Well, that's right. This is what they call the revolving door between government and the private sector, and that's especially pronounced in areas of national security. So the defense contractors want to hire uh, the senior generals and admirals as soon as they leave the service uh, because they still have connections and they can help them acquire defense contracts and provide them advice on, on, on new weapons programs. So, you know, this is, I mean, something that Eisenhower called the military industrial complex and it feeds off itself. The defense contractors know that these these retired officers uh, carry a lot of weight in Washington with Congress, and they know how things work within the Defense Department and the Pentagon, and they're essential to their business model. So this is something that's been going on for many years, and, you know, frankly, will continue to do so. I see no reason that it's going to change. On page 94 of your book, I want to read a, a couple of quotes Do you have. There's a series of them. Uh, start with this, quote, We are prevailing, Army Major General Robert Durbin, the commander in charge of training the Afghan security forces, told reporters on January the 9th, 2007. He added the Afghan Army and police, quote, continue to show great progress each day. Was he telling the truth? No, he wasn't. As we document in the book, uh, people who were advising and training the Afghan army knew that they were a disaster in the making. And yet in public, Durbin and other generals, year after year after year, kept saying the Afghan army and police forces are making great progress. They'll soon be able to defend the country on their own. So the narrative was completely at odds with the reality on the ground. And these generals in charge knew it because their trainers, the people who are actually putting the Afghans through boot camp, who were out with them on patrol, who were trying to train their leaders, they, they were reporting constantly the Afghan units weren't ready uh, for prime time, that they, they doubted they could ever take on the Taliban effectively. Uh, so the chain of command was aware of this, but they didn't want to admit it to the American people. They, so no, they weren't telling the truth. I've asked a number of people informally just to see what level of understanding people have about what's the different groups over there. And I'm going to ask you to define – you don't have to go into detail about this – but to put in perspective a number of different groups. And uh, we, we talk about them as if everybody understands them. If you, How would you define al-Qaeda? Yeah, so al-Qaeda – I covered al-Qaeda as a network for several years as a foreign correspondent. And al-Qaeda uh, – what we call al-Qaeda central – this was the original organization that was set up by Osama bin Laden and other people like Ayman al-Zawahri, who is an Egyptian doctor. And these were uh, Islamic radicals who had a worldview that they wanted to 
uh, change. They wanted to topple a lot of powers in the Middle East, like the Saudi government, the Egyptian government, that were friendly with the United States. And as we all know, al-Qaeda uh, embraced terrorism, particularly spectacular attacks like we saw on September 11th and the 1998 embassy bombings uh, that the United States had in East Africa. So this is a very defined terrorist group that bin Laden headed uh, until his death in 2011. How big are so they today, that, and where are, where are they headquartered today? Well, that's a good question. And so what happened after we invaded Afghanistan in 2001 is al-Qaeda became more diffuse. They, they sort of inspired a number of affiliate groups in other countries and other regions, like Iraq and Syria and Pakistan, that took al-Qaeda in name, but these were essentially franchises of al-Qaeda that were no, no longer directed day-to-day by bin Laden or his lieutenants. So what remains of al-Qaeda, the central organization today, is, the short answer is not much, but in a way it doesn't matter because they've already inspired and kicked off these other affiliates in North Africa, in, in Syria, and places like that. So it's metastasized as an organization, but it doesn't have the strict command and control or organization that it did 20 years ago. What is ISIS? ISIS is the Islamic State. Uh, Originally, this was focused, this was centered in Iraq and Syria, and that's a reference to the IS of ISIS. Uh, But this was a separate group from al-Qaeda. It had some affiliations, uh, but they also have inspired affiliates in in different regions throughout South Asia and and the Middle East. So there's an ISIS group in, in Afghanistan and Pakistan that they call ISIS-K, or Islamic State Khorasan, which is sort of a, a, a classical Arabic term for the region stretching from Iran uh, through Afghanistan and Pakistan. So again, like al-Qaeda, ISIS has a number of affiliates throughout the world. The Taliban. The Taliban is sort of a catch-all term for the Afghan insurgency that has fought the United States uh, from 2001 till earlier this year. Uh, The Taliban was the government of Afghanistan from 1996 to 2001 until the United States and our allies in Afghanistan forced them from power. Over time, though, the Taliban has kind of become a label that we put on anyone who is fighting the insurgency against the Afghan government and U.S. military and our allies in Afghanistan over the last 20 years. So sometimes you have groups that maybe don't see themselves as Taliban, but they're part of this insurgency trying to kick out U.S. troops. So you have a lot of factions under this broader umbrella of the Taliban. But their goals really are more focused and limited to what's going on in Afghanistan and Pakistan. Unlike al-Qaeda or ISIS, their worldview is really limited to Afghanistan and Pakistan. Back to your book on that same page and quotes, Army Major General Benjamin Freakley, commander of the 10th Mountain Division, gave an even sunnier assessment a few weeks later. Quote, we're winning, he said during a January 27th news conference. Despite the surge in bombings the year before, he declared that U.S. and Afghan forces had made great progress, in quotes, and defeated the Taliban and the terrorists that opposed this nation at every turn, unquote. Did he tell the truth? No, he didn't. And this is something you see year after year for the duration of the war, is that the generals from the United States would say, we're winning, we're turning the corner, we're prevailing, the Afghan security forces are doing very well, uh, when the documents clearly show they knew this was not the case. But this went on for 20 years. And uh, th- this is really the tragedy of the war, is that our leaders were telling us one thing in public that they knew not to be true. You relied on the Miller Center, oral history, the lessons learned, uh, WikiLeaks, the National Security Archive, the Army Center of Military History, the Combat Studies Institute at Fort Leavenworth. How do you figure out where to go and what to trust with all those different organizations? Well, that's a good question. I'm an investigative reporter, so I deal a lot in documents. And documents are kind of the gold standard when it comes to journalism and reporting because it isn't people... Uh, saying things on background or anonymously in interviews. it's These are public records or things in the public domain. So, you know, it isn't people just making stuff up as source material. It's right there in black and white. And this book, The Afghanistan Papers, is based almost entirely on documents. You described a lot of them. And I thought, in a way, there was a power in that 
to write a book about U.S. history in Afghanistan over the last 20 years and, and all the mistakes we made based solely on documents, very few of which had seen the light of day. So as I started writing based on the the lessons learned documents that we won in court from the inspector general, of course, I just want to know what other documents are out there that we haven't tapped into previously that could help us tell this greater story, this bigger, broader story of what went wrong in Afghanistan. That's what led me to oral histories that the Army had conducted with hundreds of Army and and other troops, officers in Afghanistan over the years that they had collected this this tranche of, of oral history interviews that had been uh, they, they were technically public, but most of them had never seen the light of day. There were also these interviews with senior members of the Bush administration that, as you pointed out, were conducted by the Miller Center at the University of Virginia. Those were just approved for public release in the last 18 months or so. So they were fresh, even though they dealt with events during the Bush administration. Uh, there, there were a host of other sources of documents. And, of course, you know, as reporters, we always assess the newsworthiness of these things, and also the credibility of them. And these were all, they all met the highest standard. These were uh, revelatory documents for the most part. People weren't holding back in their assessments. Uh, Other ones like diplomatic cables that had been declassified were contemporaneous records of operations in Afghanistan. So if you add it all together, that's, that's how you get this book. You draw on all this different source material, but if you add it all up, it's, it's a pretty rich, combination of material that that tells that bigger story the cigar organization says that they've employed 655 full-time staff over 13 years some 62 contractors they've saved 3.4 billion uh they have 160 convictions from criminal investigations uh 427 audits i guess the question is did we get our money out of cigar and do you think they did any good at all yeah, I think they did do good. I mean, they're also pretty accomplished at tooting their own horn. I have no reason to quibble or, or doubt the, the fraud, waste, and abuse investigations they did. They they certainly did shine a light in important areas and how money was being wasted. They brought this to public attention. And in some cases, they forwarded cases uh, to the Justice Department for prosecution. And that having that level of accountability from an auditor and inspector general is incredibly important especially given how much money we spent in Afghanistan over the last 20 years. No question. Uh, that said, my, my beef with the inspector general is these interviews they did for their Lessons Learned project, in which the people in charge of the war frankly admitted that they didn't know what they were doing, that they didn't have a strategy, that they knew the war was unwinnable, but yet let the war drag on and on. Uh, you know, Frankly, I think it's a crime that they, they kept that material secret and they didn't allow that information to become public, even though when the Washington Post asked for it, we had to, you know, again, sue twice in federal court. I think that was a dereliction of duty on their part, that they should have let that information become public so people could have been aware of this years ago. What are the chances that all of those generals would have talked if they knew they were going to have their words public? Uh, Probably they would have been much more careful, although it's hard to paint with a broad brush, a number of those interviews the inspector general did were labeled on the record. And these had the people's names. So the inspector general uh, didn't want to release them, but they knew there was no reason they couldn't identify these people. They had not granted them anonymity or guaranteed them confidentiality. These were people speaking out saying, we think it's important to go on the record. There was one interview uh, two interviews, actually, with Ambassador Ryan Crocker, who was ambassador in Afghanistan and Pakistan and Iraq. And they asked him, you know, do you want us to keep your name out of this? And he said, no, it's important. What's the point of having a lessons learned project if we don't do it on the record? And I think Ambassador Crocker was exactly right. I think there's just a, a knee-jerk reaction in Washington for people to, to go anonymous and not put their names to things. And, uh, you know, that leads to a lack of accountability and I, so I think Ambassador Crocker was absolutely right, and they should have put all this information on the record. This is a small item in your book, but I'd like to ask you to tell the comic book project story. Oh, <laughs> sorry. I, for a second, I didn't catch on your drift. Yeah, so there was a, a, a really revelatory uh, Army oral history interview 
with he was a major at the time named Louis Frias, and he was a, a psyops officer from Fort Bragg, and this was in during the Bush administration years, I think starting around 2003. So the job of a psyops unit or psychological operations unit is to try and influence people's minds in, in a war zone uh, with propaganda or other tactics to kind of get them to uh, favor your side and, and promote you know, the side you're trying to win. So Major Frias told this story in his oral history interview about how they had this idea to influence minds of Afghan youth with soccer balls that they would print up a bunch of soccer balls and 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 would also try and uh, have this comic book where they would teach Afghan youth about the importance of democracy. And they would explain democracy kind of like having a captain of a soccer team, that everybody in the team wants to elect the captain to lead the team. This was going to be explained in the comic book as a way to explain democracy. Uh, and they spent a lot of time and money on this project to come up with a comic book. Uh, and the, the army officer who was behind it said he, he never even got to see it in the end before he left Afghanistan because so many layers of review at the embassy and the military command had to sign off on it. But it, it sort of was emblematic of how the U.S. really didn't understand Afghanistan. It spent all this time and resources on what they thought were sophisticated psychological operations, trying to manipulate public opinion in Afghanistan when, you know, with comic books and soccer balls. And, you know, clearly none of it worked, that we just didn't understand this country, but we thought we could go in with these sophisticated tactics to change public opinion in a country that we, we ourselves didn't understand. Was there anything that you found in any of the interviews that you didn't publish on purpose because you thought it was a security problem? No. In fact, the Washington Post made a decision early on at the highest levels that all the interviews we obtained from the inspector general, all the other materials we used in our, our newspaper series in December 2019, that we were going to post it all online. This was all unclassified material. Uh, we'd won this through our FOIA lawsuits, and we thought the public had a right, you know, this was public information. The public had a right to see it for themselves. And we spent a great deal of time trying to present it in an easily accessible way and and weave it in with our news story so people could see for themselves the documents and the quotations. But this was all unclassified. Uh, there was no security risk. This, these were just people describing all the mistakes that were made in Afghanistan. But it, there was nothing that would put anyone at risk in terms of military operations or anything like that. What was Operation River Dance? Operation River Dance was an effort in 2006 by the United States and the Afghan army to eradicate opium poppy production in Afghanistan, particularly in Helmand province, which is this dusty, hot desert province in southern Afghanistan that was the epicenter of opium production, not just in Afghanistan, but the whole world. You know, over the years, Afghanistan has supplied uh, somewhere between 80 and 90 percent of opium to the world. It's it's the biggest producer, and Helmand was the center of that. Operation River Dance was a, a sort of a military security operation where the Afghan security forces, with advice from the U.S. military and State Department and Drug Enforcement Administration, they were going to go through Helmand province and physically uh, eradicate all these opium plants that had been had been raised. And they would do this with really primitive means. They would have tractors dragged through the fields with these sleds that would knock down the plants. And they had you know, small armies of, of guys with sticks or machetes to, to literally whack all the plants. And this, this operation in public, U.S. officials and Afghan officials kept saying how great it was and what a success it was. There was even a prediction from an Afghan official in Helmand that soon, within a matter of months, they would stop all opium growing and production in that province, which would have been an enormous achievement. But in documents for the book, in Army Oral Histories and other papers, uh, the people who were involved from the American side said it was a disaster from the beginning, that this thing went awry from the start because uh, they would, the Afghans would really just selectively target the fields of poor farmers, which just drove them into the arms of the Taliban, because then these poor Afghan farmers didn't have another livelihood. So, of course, they got angry at the Americans and the Afghan government and joined the insurgency. At the same time, the Afghans would 
spare the fields of people with political connections in Afghanistan, like warlords or other people who were corrupt in the government. So it became a way for uh, the corrupt Afghan officials to sort of rub out their competition in the opium trade. So th- this really was a debacle from the from the get go, and and even though again in public. U.S. and Afghan officials kept seeing how successful it was. Any American going to pay a price for spending $9 billion on the drug uh, issue over in Afghanistan and having poppies be more, uh, they're more being grown now than ever? Well, that's right. And this is the irony. Despite us spending $9 billion over 20 years to try and reduce drug production in Afghanistan, uh, the amount of opium being raised over there, these opium poppies, these, these flowers is what they look like. Uh, but they, they produce resin that's made, that's used to produce opium and then heroin and morphine. Uh, the production has tripled over the last 20 years. So despite our efforts to curtail it, it's only made the problem worse. Now, most of that opium doesn't go to the United States. It goes to other parts of Asia and Europe, but it certainly feeds the global markets. It's 80 to 90 percent of the global supply. So directly or indirectly, this obviously affects the United States. But, uh, you know, we we only made the problem worse after spending $9 billion to try and curtail it. Quote from your book, Major Douglas Ross, a U.S. military advisor embedded with a unit of Afghan soldiers called River Dance, an, un- an illegal operation and worried it would trigger a mass revolt against U.S. and Afghan forces. Quote, if somebody's in there fleecing the people and we're providing security, then we're sending the wrong message, unquote, he said in an Army oral history interview. Believe me, my hair turned white by the end of this operation. Right, and that's the power of these interviews and these documents. He's so stark in his criticism of this operation, saying, you know, my hair turned white. That's how worried I was. So the guys on the ground know what a disaster this is in the making, and yet in public the generals are saying, oh, this is great, you know, this is working uh, we're making we're making progress. This is in a very effective operation. So it really just goes to show the the official deception at the highest levels was was kind of mind blowing in some regards. But you know, Major Ross here, the other point he's he's talking about an illegal operation. He's saying the United States shouldn't be getting involved the way it was on the ground with the military. The military was there to fight the Taliban, Al Qaeda, and other insurgents. This was something. They never really worked out under Obama, Bush or Trump was what's the role of the military in this war on drugs? Why are we using soldiers over there to get involved in in countering drug production when our mission is supposed to be fighting Al Qaeda or the Taliban? This is a a, a question we never really answered and things got really tangled up. Peter Ross and others were also pointing out that the statistics we reported to Congress about the supposed success of the mission were distorted or made up. So that's another reason why they called it an illegal mission. How is it that U.S. aid workers once insisted on carrying out a public health project to teach Afghans how to wash their hands? Well, that's right. This is another good example of an interview. Uh, this was actually an interview with a, an Afghan official who is a governor, Toril Iwesa, who said that you know, this is how ridiculous it was with these aid projects the Americans were doing. They should have asked us what we could have used. Instead, the Americans would come in and act like they knew it all and would tell us what to do. So they had this project to teach Afghans uh, good hygiene measures to wash their hands several times a day. And as the governor was pointing out, it's like, you know, Afghan, we go to pray. We're a devout people. We, we know how to wash our hands. This is silly. Why are they teaching us how to do this? And yet, the Americans wasted a lot of money on projects like that. And that, that was his primary example of how foolish a lot of these projects were. Again, do you know of any congressional hearing committee chairman calling anybody in to justify the expenditure of the $9 billion? There were a number of hearings about the money being spent against uh, opium production in Afghanistan, but it was actually the other direction that most members of Congress thought we weren't spending or doing enough. Uh, both during the Bush administration and Obama administration in particular, there was real pressure from members of Congress on the U.S. military and the State Department to do more. So actually, Congress was the main driver of all these programs like Operation River Dance and other other attempts to curtail production rather than try and rein it in. 
In your book, in a lessons learned interview, an unidentified NATO official said he was given the task of trying to secure financing for the generators from international donors, but got nowhere. Quote, anyone who looked at this more closely could see that the math didn't add up, that it was all nonsense, he said. We went to the World Bank and they didn't want to touch it. People look at it and they think it's crazy. By December 2018, the U.S. government had spent $775 million on the dam, the diesel generators, and the electrical projects in Kandahar and neighboring Helmand province, according to a federal audit. What's the background on all that? Well, Brian, this is another debacle in which we were trying to build up the Afghan state. And, you know, our intentions were to make life better for Afghan citizens, but it, it really backfired. The, the dam in question is the Kajaki Dam, which is in southern Afghanistan, again, in Helmand province, which uh, the United States had actually helped build back in the 1960s as a hydroelectric project. Uh, the dam had uh, fallen into disrepair over the years uh, because of all the civil war and, and Soviet occupation of Afghanistan. So the Americans thought, well, we'll help fix the dam and generate electricity for Kandahar, which is the biggest city in the south and, and the surrounding region. Uh, unfortunately, the Taliban controlled a lot of the territory around the dam, so it became very expensive to try and go in and make repairs. And yet, so we would ferry in repair crews with these big turbines and other things by helicopter, but it it, it just, things fell apart with this electrification project. And as you pointed out, uh, we we spent hundreds of millions of dollars trying to bring electricity to different parts of Afghanistan. Let me ask you about nation building. Um, You, chapter, uh, page 163. Under both Bush and Obama, you write, U.S. officials steadfastly avoided the term nation building. Everybody knew they were doing it, but there was an unspoken rule against admitting it in public. One of the few who did was General David Petraeus. So were, when officials said we weren't nation building, were they lying? They were. They were lying. So this goes back actually to the start of the war and before. When President Bush was running for office the first time against Al Gore, in 2000, he was very critical of the Clinton administration for what he called nation-building programs in failed states like Somalia or Haiti or in the Balkans, where we had military operations. And he said, I'm not going to use the military for nation-building if I'm president. Well, a year later, he becomes president, and uh, we get involved in Afghanistan, Bush sends troops there. And even though the Taliban uh, was removed from power quickly, Afghanistan was just really a broken country. It was devastated economically. There were millions of refugees. Uh, There was real fear of a famine. So Bush knew the United States had an obligation to do something to try and stabilize the country and help the people. But his campaign promise was that he wouldn't do any nation building. So it became a real political problem for him. So in public, he kept saying, we're not nation building in Afghanistan or we'll let other countries do that. Uh, But in private, they knew they needed to do something. This became pronounced under Obama, too, because he came into office uh, promising to end the war in Iraq, but trying to fix things in Afghanistan. But as you remember, this was after this terrible recession in 2007 and 2008 in particular. So there wasn't much public appetite to spend an enormous amount of money in a faraway country when we had you know, our own economy was really suffering. So Obama said also, we're not going to do nation building in Afghanistan. The the nation I'm most interested in building is here at home. But again, he was he spent even more in Afghanistan than Bush did on these nation building programs. And that's how you had Petraeus's comment where he he actually told the truth. He had been asked before Congress uh, by a member of the Senate. You know, I think the the senator thought they would actually catch Petraeus uh, fibbing about it. She said, you know, are, are you nation building in Afghanistan? He said, no, yeah, of course we are. You bet we are. That's exactly what we're doing. I'm not going to sugarcoat it. And I think the Senate was actually shocked that he actually admitted this publicly, even though, of course, they were authorizing all this money to do exactly that. They knew exactly what was going on. Do you know of anybody that is at this point uh, saying that Afghanistan, the war was worth it? Not many. I think this is something that the Biden administration, as well as the people who who oversaw the war for many years, are really struggling with. You know, how do you justify what we did or what we didn't accomplish? You know, the best thing that you can come up with, and this is something Biden has argued, is that, you know, the original goal 
the original mission was clear, which was to go over and destroy al-Qaeda and prevent it from carrying out a repeat of the September 11th attacks. And, you know, I think arguably we accomplished that in terms of uh, inflicting damage on al-Qaeda's core organization. Uh, Bin Laden and just about all of his original lieutenants are, are dead or had been captured. The only primary one from those days who's still at large is uh, Ayman al-Zawahiri, the Egyptian deputy of al-Qaeda under Bin Laden, who's now you know, on paper at least, sort of oversees it. So that old al-Qaeda group was effectively destroyed. And you can say we accomplished that, uh, although what has been accomplished since bin Laden was killed in 2011 is really much harder to point to anything. What, you know, what we can say uh, was achieved over the last 10 years in particular, you know, it's just, it's almost impossible to cite anything. All the money we spent on defending the Afghan government, building up the Afghan army, uh, went up in smoke. And that went up in smoke very visibly over the last several weeks when we saw the Taliban sweep through all the provincial capitals and, and waltz into Kabul and take over the whole of the country. You have a lot of this in your book, but I found an article in Forbes in which talking about the money and uh they listed 10 different examples of how money was spent. And I just go down the list very quickly. And you can pick up on any of them after I get through this. Afghan security forces, $82.9 billion invested into the Afghan security forces fund since the inception. Uh, two, anti-narcotics campaign, as we said earlier, $9 billion spent on counter-narcotics efforts. Three, U.S. Embassy, $1.5 billion spent on the U.S. Embassy, which includes the security, construction, and maintenance. Four, Respect Women campaign, more than $800 million and maybe billion since 2001 to encourage Taliban and other Islamic groups to respect women. Let me just stop there. $800 million to try to convince the Taliban and other Islamic groups to respect women. Who thought that would work? Lots of members of Congress and different administrations. I mean, people will remember uh, Hillary Clinton when she was Secretary of State during the Obama years. This was a primary focus of hers, was to promote the rights of women and children, uh, particularly girls. And, you know, there's no question women have suffered horribly in Afghanistan over the years under the Taliban and other groups. And we're seeing a return to those days now with the Taliban back in charge. So there's real fear that any progress that was made on women's rights is, is going to vanish. Uh, but, you know, understandably, a lot of critics are saying that's not why we went to war in Afghanistan. We weren't, you know, as bad as women were being treated. That's not why we send uh, thousands and thousands of U.S. troops to another country to invade it. You know, we were trying to uh, dis- dismantle al-Qaeda and prevent it from carrying out more terrorist attacks. And this is one reason why the war dragged on, because we sort of tacked on these other goals and objectives, uh, like promoting uh, equal rights for Afghan women or human rights. Those are all noble goals, but that's not why we went to war to begin with. But do you have any idea how they spent $800 million to encourage Taliban and other Islamist groups to respect women? I mean, what evidence is there anywhere that they respect women, uh, certainly allow them to work, they made them cover their entire bodies and all that stuff? Where would you spend $800 million? Well, I think some of that, what they're talking about, and I'd have to look at more closely which programs, but there was an inordinate amount of money spent on trying to encourage Afghans to send their, their daughters, their girls to school. And there, there was a lot of progress in that regard over the last 20 years. Many more hundreds of thousands of girls were able to get a, a much better education than they had uh, in Afghanistan for years and years. So I, I don't want to minimize it entirely, but as you put it, phrasing it, trying to expect the, the Taliban to respect women, uh, if there were any programs trying to change attitudes in that regard, those were kind of doomed to failure. Another item on this list from Forbes is lost drones. $174 million on drones that were lost in Afghanistan. How do you lose a drone? Well, this is actually something I, I wrote about in an investigative series through the Washington Post. It, it's not that hard to lose a drone, particularly the big ones that are known as uh, predators or reapers. These are ones that fly around pretty slowly, about 100 miles an hour. They look like small turboprop planes almost. But uh, even though they're supposed to be operated remotely and are supposed to be reliable to return to base and and maneuvered without pilots, a lot of times we'd lose the satellite link, particularly in Afghanistan, but also in Iraq. 
and these drones would would just disappear into the wild blue yonder, and sometimes they'd crash into mountains, sometimes they'd crash into villages or, or harm property, and there were a lot of close calls where they would also crash upon landing at U.S. military bases. So the number of drones that crashed or were lost in Afghanistan was pretty high, uh, but this was something, again, that most Americans didn't see because the U.S. military didn't like to publicize this at all. Ashraf Ghani left the country um, right at the end of, of uh, our involvement over there. And there was a report that he took millions of dollars with him. Um, he was an American citizen until 2009 for a while. Spent about, what, 12, 13 years in this country teaching and going to school. Did we try to – did we put him into that job as president over there? And if we did, how did we do it legally? And do you think he left the country with uh, – buckets of money well the last question is to the buckets of money i have no idea i don't have any percent knowledge whether he did or not i think that's a, a report that's been uncorroborated certainly there were a lot of afghan officials who did leave the country with a lot of money they tend to deposit it in banks in dubai or buy property down there and this has been a problem for 20 years where a lot of afghans who got wealthy off the war uh, deposited their money outside the country or offshore uh, Ashraf Ghani is an interesting case because he's emblematic of another problem we had in understanding in Afghanistan. This was somebody who was an Afghan national but had spent a good part of his adult life and career in the United States and other Western countries. And he was seen as a, as a smart, even brilliant person whose specialty, ironically, was how to rebuild failed states. So when, when it came to economic questions, he was very good. But as a, as a political leader of Afghanistan, uh, he, was, he was incompetent, very ineffective. There was a story that just a couple days before the Taliban swept into Kabul, Ghani was trying to host a conference on digitizing uh, government operations and that the Americans couldn't get him to pay attention to the, the fact that the Taliban was sweeping through the whole country. So this, in the end, he, he was a very clueless leader really didn't have his finger on what was going on in his country. But yes, the, the Americans did help put him in power. When Ghani was first elected and then re-elected, both of those campaigns and, and votes were seen widely as to be fraudulent. But the United States, because it was friendly with him, and frankly, he, he spoke very good English, and he knew how to deal with Americans, you know, we tolerated him in office and supported him. We've had you talking for an hour, and i got a couple questions, and we'll let you go. What was Project Avocado? <laughs> Project Avocado was a name for uh, the Washington Post effort to work on the Afghanistan papers and collect them and produce them in, in our original series in, in December 2019. That was a sort of whimsical name I came up with because I was worried that I had all these documents that I knew were extremely newsworthy, and I didn't want them to leak out. I didn't want our comp competitors in the news business to find out about it. So we had so many people in the newsroom who were needed to help produce this series and edit it that I, I, I knew this would attract attention every time we'd have these meetings with 10 or 15 people and they'd wonder what we were working on. So we referred to it as Project Avocado uh, simply because I wanted to come up with a name for it that nobody would associate with Afghanistan. It was the first thing that came up, first word that came to, to, came to mind. And uh, actually, it, it sounds silly, but it worked in the end. We were able to keep a a lid on the project, and uh, it was it was a big surprise when it came out in December 2019. What evidence do you have at the Post that this was successful? So our original series in December 2019 was the most read piece of journalism that year. You know, we, we published six separate articles uh, over a week, and, and as well as numerous videos and audio reports. And this this is to this day all this database of documents that we posted online from the Lessons Learned program still get thousands and thousands of readers uh, each week. So this is something that's had an enduring effect and was you almost universally praised by our, leadership, uh, by our readership. It led to a surge in subscriptions to the Washington Post. So this was something that showed a real hunger among the public for high-quality investigative reporting. And I think our readers really appreciated the fact that the Post went to such lengths in terms of uh, our legal battle and our reporting resources to bring this story to light. Who is Jennifer Toth and how do you know her? 
Uh, Jennifer, you sound like a prosecutor, but uh, Jennifer <laughs> Toast. <laughs> Like I'm, af- I'm afraid to admit this, but uh, Jennifer <laughs> Toth is my lovely wife, <laughs> and we've been married for 25 years, and I love her very much. And what does she do for a living? She's also an author and journalist. She's actually been interviewed by you in the past. Uh, she writes nonfiction books and uh, is actually a much better writer than I am. You can tell her that was the highlight of her interview when I asked you that question. <laughs> um, she'll be glad to hear it, and, and hopefully I didn't screw up the answer. And what about Kyle Whitlock? Well, he's our son, and uh, we love him very much, too. In terms of Afghanistan, it's something I note in the book. He was just a year old, one year old. He was an infant when uh, 9-11 happened and when I first went to help cover the war in late 2001. Uh, Now the war has finally ended, at least American involvement, but he's 20 years old. He's now a college junior at Emory University. So really, his whole life, uh, has been all he's known since he's been alive is the fact that the U.S. had been war in Afghanistan and that his dad was helping to cover the war. So uh, I think that's something that a lot of older Americans forget that, you know, such a large proportion of our population, all they've ever known is the fact that we've been at war since September 11th. How many times have you been to Afghanistan? Uh, honestly, Brian, I, I can't count. I don't want to say it's more than anybody else by a long stretch, but over the years, it's been a lot. I first went to the region in 2001. I ended up spending more time in Pakistan because of events there, but I was a foreign correspondent for several years uh, based in Europe covering counterterrorism. So I went to Afghanistan, Pakistan, the region quite a bit. Starting in 2010, I became a Pentagon beat reporter. So from 2010 to 2017, I would often go to Afghanistan at least a few times a year with traveling with the Secretary of Defense or military commanders. Uh, So this is something I I don't want to mislead people and make them think I was living in Afghanistan like uh, many of our bureau chiefs in Kabul. I don't have that level of expertise in Afghanistan living there. But in terms of military operations and covering the war, this is something I've done for the last 20 years. Do you ever get tired of talking about this subject? Uh, no, I mean, uh, the one subject I'm happy to talk to you off about is Fat Leonard. Uh, that's, that's a fascinating tale to me. It's, Afghanistan's, uh, I don't want to say depressing, but it, it's a tougher subject because so many people have paid the ultimate price here, both Afghans, Americans, and others, and it's just been a real frustration to watch the whole war unfold. And But I think it's also incredibly important to document and show to the American people uh, just how their leaders didn't tell them the truth about how the war was going. And on many occasions, they, they flat out lied. And I think that's just very, very important to document and show in no uncertain terms how that happened. So, you know, everything we've documented in this book, nobody's disputed any of it. When we use terms like lie or misled or used official deception, you know, I don't use those terms lightly. Uh, I always back it up with documents or with other facts. But I think We've demonstrated beyond a reasonable doubt that the U.S. government did consistently mislead and lie to the American people about how the war was going for 20 years. Who is the most irritated at you and the Post? Um, well, there's probably a long, long line of people who are irritated at the Post. Uh, actually, I haven't gotten much pushback on this. I think I was surprised a lot of feedback I've gotten from people who, frankly, don't look very good in the Afghanistan papers or uh, maybe didn't want those documents to become public. I think actually a lot of them have kind of come around to the idea that it is important to shine a light on all this. People who were nervous at first when we published the documents, actually now, uh, you know, they they are very complimentary of the the work we did to bring this material to light. And so I've been pleasantly surprised by that, at at the lack of pushback and actually some people who've, who've changed their minds about the importance of, of bringing this to public attention. Last last question. Um, you say that it all started when you heard that there was an interview with Michael Flynn, former general, um, and who uh, was very much a controversy during the Trump administration. But it started an interview back in 2015, I believe you said. But in the end, in the book, you only quoted him three times. Yeah, that's a good point. And we quoted him more in the original series, and we posted his entire interview. I think you know, Flynn over the years became increasingly radicalized politically, and in recent years he's become a, a much discredited figure because he's become 
a follower of QAnon and some of these other conspiracy groups. So I didn't want to hold him up as the prime example or a voice of authority on what happened in Afghanistan, because I think a lot of people hear the name Michael Flynn and they, they kind of cringe, uh, you know, because he, he has been a discredited figure who uh, originally pleaded guilty to lying to the FBI. So his credibility isn't very good, even though, as you point out, he was the original person who I'd heard had given this interview. And that's that's what got the whole reporting project rolling. Last question. When are we going to get the book on Fat Leonard? Uh, hopefully end of next year. I've been working on that hard and I'm working on it as we speak. And I, once this trial gets wrapped up and we learn Fat Leonard's fate, he's still waiting to get sentenced. Hopefully we'll we'll be able to bring that book right out. Seems like you got plenty of time. They don't move too fast on this. Anyway, The Afghanistan Papers is the name of the book, The Secret History of the War. Our guest has been Craig Whitlock of The Washington Post, and we thank you very much. Thank you, Brian. Really enjoyed it, and, and thanks for your attention to it. Thanks for listening. Please rate, review, and subscribe to this podcast wherever you get your podcasts. We would love to hear from you. You can email us at podcasts at c-span.org.